Math 265A, Quest to College. I'm Joe Vasta, and today we are covering section 3.7, the chain rule. And the chain rule describes the derivative of a composition. So we have a composition here, the derivative of f of g of x equals f prime g of x g prime of x. We are not going to do the proof on this, but what we are going to do is this problem. So let's go ahead and see what we have here. This problem says y equals the sine of x squared plus 1. So that right there can be considered a composition. So look at this. This is f of g of x. And function g is the function that you see sometimes inside. So what we want to do is call function g perhaps x squared plus 1. And function f is the one that you see on the outside, which is sine of something. So why don't we go ahead and do that? I'm going to do this problem textbook way, and then after that I'm going to show you a quicker way of doing this problem. So this is the way a lot of the calculus teachers show this. So you go f of x is the sine of x, and g of x is the inside part. So this is x squared plus 1. So we could check to see if f of g of x is our function that we were given. Um, well, if you put g inside of f, you know, like f of 4 is sine of 4, and f of pi is sine of 5, uh, sine of pi, f of trash can is sine of trash can, f of x squared plus 1 is sine of x squared plus 1. So this does describe what we have here. So we've set up our function as a composition of two functions. Now I see some derivatives up here in the chain rule. So this is the chain rule. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, take the derivative of f and take the derivative of g. The derivative of f, the derivative of the sine, is the cosine. And the derivative of g is 2x. Okay, so now it's time to do the chain rule. y prime equals, I'll write out the chain rule, f prime g of x, and then we have g prime of x. Okay, let's write another step. This is f prime g of x. Well, what is g of x? g of x is x squared plus 1. And then this is g prime of x. Okay, so f prime is a function itself. So f prime of 5 is cosine of 5, and f prime of trash can is cosine of trash can. f prime of this junk is the cosine of this junk. So this first part becomes cosine of x squared plus 1. g prime of x is written right there, so this is multiplied by 2x. And so our final answer, we put the 2x out front, 2x cosine of x squared plus 1. So we don't want to um, give the impression that this 2x is part of the um, argument for the cosine. And usually the cosine um, takes the first term that it sees, and that's actually one term right there. So you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to put parentheses around that cosine, and then I move the 2x out front. So this right here is the derivative of something that we could not take the derivative of before this section. And let me emphasize that this is the textbook 
way. And now let's talk about a simpler way of doing the chain rule. So the chain rule really says this. If you want to take the derivative of f of something, what it really is is f prime of something times the derivative of something, if I can spell correctly. And so that's what it is. And so if, if you think of it like this, you don't have to write all four of those functions down. You don't have to take this many steps. You can almost get this problem done in one or two steps. So what I'm going to do, so we don't have room on this paper, I will actually officially call this problem number one and we will do a few problems with the chain rule with this more efficient way. Now what I have written here is written on the next piece of paper at the bottom and so our directions are find the derivative and so let's see if we can do this problem more efficiently. So y prime is, okay, this looks like f of something. You have sine of something. So you take the derivative of the sine. The derivative of the sine is the cosine. So this is going to be cosine of the something. Leave the something alone. And then that's going to be multiplied by the derivative of the something. The derivative of this inside layer is 2x. Now, as you do more of these, you might just jump right to putting the 2x in front without that middle step there. So there it is. There's the derivative of a composition. Okay, let's go ahead and you try this problem on your own. Pause the video. Okay. So you either tried the problem on your own or you're just like, yeah, I'm going to see what he does. Let's take the derivative of this right here. The derivative of f of something. Well, this is really, the f in this case is cosine, cosine of something. So let's try this out. It's the derivative of cosine, which is negative sine, and you keep the something in there. That's going to be multiplied by, multiplied by the derivative of the something. And what is the derivative of this something? It is 5. Let's go clean things up. We like our coefficients in the front. So the derivative is negative 5 sine 5x. And we really don't need those parentheses around the argument there because 5x is just one term. Um, I believe, I may have got this, maybe I just put the parentheses there just because we're um, doing the chain rule, which is the derivative of a composition. And I just want it to emphasize that's the inside part, so I put the parentheses there. So there it is. That's how you do the chain rule. Um, deal is... The chain rule seems pretty simple, but when you have like a composition that is more than two functions, then it can get pretty confusing. So I've got this great analogy. I mean, I, I found this in, in a book and I thought that was kind of cool. Not in our textbook. But then I came up with this analogy when I was in college and it really helped people out. So I'm gonna, I have a picture drawn on this one. This is problem number three. The directions are find the derivative and we have y equals the square root sine e and then we, this is raised to the 5x plus 3 power. 
So what am I going to do to find the derivative of that? Well, this happens to be a triple composition. We're not going to write out the triple composition. What we're going to do is first maybe um, rewrite this square root so it says the one half power. Okay, so this is y equals sine e raised to the 5x plus 3. And I'm actually going to put parentheses around the argument of the sine this time. And then this is all raised to the 1 half power. Okay, so look what we have on the outside. That's what I always focus on. What is on the outside? The outside is the 1 half. Well, this bad guy is trying to break into this house. And what do you see on the outside that he has to get through? He has to get through the fence. He has to jump the fence or whatever. Okay. So assuming I took care of the fence, what's the next thing that you see on the outside? Well, you see the sign. And the sign is analogous to the dog. Then he has to take care of the dog. So he's a bad guy. He's trying to break into the house. And then after he takes care of the dog, we all want to say what he does to the dog, then what he has to take care of, if the sign's gone and the one half's gone, you have e to some power, you have to take care of e to some power. E is the next thing, and the next thing in this picture is this little, this little thing down here. I know I'm not um, an art teacher. That little thing is the alarm. He has to then take care of the alarm. That's like e to something. And then once he takes care of e to something, the last thing he has to shoot with his derivative gun is that thing up there, which is the 5x plus 3, which represents the door. Oh, and by the way, this is a bad guy, okay? So that's a bad guy. Here, we'll even put a gun in his... Okay, that's... Yeah, there it is. He's going to try to break into the house, and that's how we are going to take this derivative. Let me go ahead and, you know, maybe in a different color. Let's, how about purple? This kind of looks like this, and maybe it's not going to make sense to some of you guys. We said the sign was the dog, so we have dog, we have alarm, we have door, one, two, three, and then we have the fence. So all those connections I made verbally are right here. Okay? The dog is the sign, the E is the alarm, the door is that inside part. So this is what the chain rule is. Uh, we better give ourselves some space right here. So I'll go a little bit lower than I, when I have to. You take care of these things one at a time. So you take care of the thing that's on the outside. How do I take the derivative of something to the one half power? Well, the derivative of something to the one half power is one half, here's the something, I'll keep the parentheses I guess, So I'm doing the power rule, something to the one-half. The derivative is one-half something to the negative one-half. Now I know some of you might go, oh, you're ruining your picture, but okay, that's all right. I've just taken care of the fence. Now it's like I'm just taking the derivative of this right here. Ignore the one half. He's gone. I've just jumped the fence and now I'm taking care of the dog. So I'm going to multiply because this is all the chain rule. Do I know how to take the derivative of sine of something? Yeah, the derivative of sine something is cosine something.
So guess what I just did? I got rid of the sign. I just killed off the dog. I know that's bad. We don't want to kill dogs after this, after watching this video, but we just got rid of the dog. And now we're still doing the chain rule. I've got to take care of the alarm. See, there's the alarm right there, which is e to something. Do I know the derivative of e to something? e being the superman of all functions? Yeah, the derivative of e to something is e to something. So this is e to something. Okay, we've just taken care of the alarm. We've defused it. And now what I have left is that little polynomial that says 5x plus 3, and that's the door. So what is the derivative of 5x plus 3? The derivative of 5x plus 3 is 5. And for all you perfectionists, I'll go ahead and cross that out, and now we're in the house. So that's how we play the game. We want to simplify this answer. This one is actually, um, we see this in the homework. It's, it's um, going to be one of the harder problems in the homework. I don't know if this is an exact homework problem, but this is going to be one of those tougher problems. And I think what I said, a triple composition, is, is it a triple composition or a quadruple composition? Let's see, one, two, Three. I think it involves four functions, so maybe we do have the triple composition. Um, or maybe that's quadruple. But in any case, we got this done. We didn't have to write out all the functions that we needed to do the composition of, and that's the textbook method. What we do want to do here is to finish this up. This part's going to get sucked down to the bottom. There's going to be a fraction here. And so I have the 2 on the bottom. And then I have this stuff, because there's a negative 1 half power. I'll write that as the square root of the sign, square root of what I see in here. And I don't, I'm not going to use as many parentheses. So this is the sign e raised to the 5x plus 3. And then on the top, I have all this stuff. I'm going to go ahead and put the 5 first, because it's a coefficient. I'll also put the e to the 5x plus 3. And then on this cosine business here, cosine, I'm just writing this down here, cosine e raised to the 5x plus 3 power. You can keep the parentheses around the argument of the cosine, but it's just one term, so this is acceptable. This right here, oh well, that's the answer. So that's how you do the chain rule. Think of it as, you know, some people say think of it as peeling the layers off an onion. That's kind of the same thing. I mean, things are linked together, you know, so they're all linked together through composition. That's probably why it's called the chain rule. So let's go ahead and do some more problems and see that maybe this section is not going to be as stressful as you thought it was going to be. And when you saw me do problem number one the textbook way, that did look pretty bad. Let's go ahead and do this problem here. Um, I'm going to do this problem two ways. The first way I'm going to do it is using the chain rule. Okay, so I'll use chain rule here. Okay, so y prime is... Okay, chain rule, what's the thing that's on the outside? It's this 3. So. What is the derivative of something to the third? Well, it's 3 times something to the second. And guess what? I've just jumped the fence. I cross out the 3. I'm not saying that's not part of the function, but it just helps me psychologically to get this problem done. Now, I'm taking the derivative of the something, the derivative of the inside, which is what? 2x plus 1, the derivative of that is 2. So guess what? Look at this. My end result is 6. And we have 2x plus 1 quantity squared, and we can keep our answer lap that way, so we'll box it and be done. Now the other way that I want to show you is 
taken the derivative first by expanding that. Expand y equals 2x plus 1 cubed. This equals. So I'm going to go ahead, um, you can write out three copies of those and do a FOIL first and then multiply that. I'm going to um, use the binomial theorem. So I go to row three. I write those down. So one, three, three, one. This guy right here, 2x. He's fully alive. He's to the third power. So this is the binomial theorem. And now he's slowly dying. Slowly dying until he's 2x to the zero. Now what? I'll write that in red. 2x to the zero. Meanwhile, 1 is completely dead. It's 1 to the zero. And then it's 1 to the 1, 1 to the 2, 1 to the 3. Now what I'm going to do is, here's my first term right here. It is 8x cubed. So here's 8x cubed. The next one is, um, let's see, this is going to be 4x squared times 3. So that is 12x squared. And then this one's going to be 3 times 2x. And then those are all just 1s there. So that's 6. Um, what do we have? Yeah, that's 6x. And then the last one here, I mean, that's just to the 1, 1, so this is plus 1. So there's the function. Expand it. And in this problem, you can do that. But in the um, problem where there was a square root, you know, if that was a square root instead of um, a, a third power, then you couldn't expand it out like this. So now I'm going to zap each of those four terms with the derivative gun. And when I do that, I end up getting... 24x squared plus 24x plus 6. And you know what? This is acceptable as well. In fact, if we multiply that out, this is exactly what we're going to get. You can verify that on your own. So both are acceptable. This way was faster, the chain rule. So I wanted to do a problem where we used the chain rule, but then we did it a different way and ended up getting the same exact answer. Well, I mean, it doesn't look the same, but algebraically it is the same answer. So let's go ahead and um, do more chain rule. And that's basically what you have to um, figure out in this section. Can you do the chain rule? So here's pro problem five and problem six. Go ahead and pause the video and see if you can do these ones on your own. Okay, let's tackle problem number five. This is a y prime equals. Okay, the chain rule says identify the thing that's on the outside, which is the three-fourths power. Okay, so I have to take the derivative of something to the three-fourths power. It's going to be 3 fourths times something and then I go one less than that or 3 fourths minus 1 which is negative 1 fourth. That takes care of the fence. Now I'm breaking into this thing. I'm just going to take the derivative of 4x minus 3 which is 4. Okay, we just have to simplify our answers. Um, we don't want any negative exponents, so I'm going to go ahead and cross out the 4s. Those cancel. And I'm going to cross the line, change the sign on this one, because there is a line on, on the bottom. You still have a 1. And so I end up having 3 on the top and 4x minus 3 to the 1 fourth on the bottom, which you can write as the fourth root if you'd like, but I'll just keep it this way. There's my derivative. And I don't have to um, say y prime equals this. I could just say there, there's the derivative because that's what it's asking for. Okay, look at this problem here. y equals 
3 secant squared 5x. Okay, this squared here, what it really means, this is just notation that we do in trig, is it means secant 5x, the whole thing squared. That's what that squared means. Okay, so you're going to go secant 5x and do that twice. So that is the function we're trying to take the derivative of. And what do we see on the outside? We see this 3 here, but I mean, this is the thing we're concerned with. Here's the fence right there. So let's go ahead and see if we can do this. y prime equals, what if I had to take the derivative of 3 something squared? Well, that squared would jump down and make it into 6 something. So that's what I'm going to write. I'm going to write 6 something. And you could say that's to the 1 power then, if you want. Okay, usually we wouldn't put that in our answer. So now I've just taken care of the fence. Okay, what is the derivative? Now, okay, so now I've, I can ignore the 3 and the 2. I'm looking at secant 5x. So I'm just concentrating on that. What is the derivative of secant something? The derivative of secant something is secant something tangent something. So now we've taken care of the dog the dog called secant. And so we can cross that off our list. We've already taken care of this too. We can cross that out. And so now what are we left with? We are left with the derivative of 5x, which is 5. So now I want to clean up my answer. And the first thing that I want to do is say, well, look, there's a 5 times a 6, 30. I have a secant 5x times a secant 5x. That's actually secant squared 5x. And then, then the only other thing we have is the tangent 5x. I'll write tangent 5x right here. So we have that right there. We have this times this times this. And so we are done with problem number six. There's the answer. Okay, so this one was a little bit more complicated than this one. There, there were actually, actually three functions that we could have written out on this um, if you were doing it the textbook way and you would have had a triple composition instead of just a regular double composition. Or maybe you know when I'm saying that, I'm, I mean a single composition has one composition, it has two, this would have two functions and then this one would have three functions if you did it the textbook way. Okay, well let's just go ahead and do a few more problems here. Um, maybe you can pause the video and see if you can do these problems on your own. Okay, the derivative of e raised to the sine 8x. So e to the power sine 8x. Okay, so what we want to do is we want to say, well, what's the thing that's on the outside? It's the e to something. And what is the derivative of e to something? It is e to something. So there it is. I'll put the parentheses there if you'd like, but you don't need them there. So that takes care of the fence, or whatever, the first layer of protection on this. Now I'm taking the derivative of sine 8x. Well, the thing that's on the outside is the sine. If you like, you can put parentheses around that 8x. You don't need to do that. So the derivative of the sine of something is the cosine of something. So that takes care of the dog. And now I'm just taking the derivative of 8x. The derivative of 8x is 8. 
So we're going to clean this up so the coefficient is in the front. So this is 8 e raised to the sine 8x times the cosine 8x. And I don't need those parentheses because that's just one term anyway. There's my answer. Imagine doing these problems using the definition of the derivative, you know, the one that has the difference quotient. It would be insane. It would be crazy. It could be done, but now that we have shortcuts and the chain rule really is a shortcut, we can find the velocity function a lot faster. With greater velocity. <laughs> okay, so um, let's do this one right here. Now things are going to get a little bit more complicated because we're going to mix a little chain rule with some of the other rules we know. And what do I mean by that? Well, look at this. There's a square root, so I mean we can see that and there's 3x plus 1 under there. There's going to be some chain rule and same here. But that right there is a product. So let's see um, what we can do with this problem. First thing I want to do is change that square root to a one-half power. Okay, so I'm going to do product rule. And I've been using the green pin. No, I've been using the red pin for a product, but you know what? I'm going to use the green pin. So it's the product of those two functions. We want to use the product rule. Okay, what does the product rule say? It says the derivative of the first times the second plus the first times the derivative of the second. Okay, the derivative of the first. So I'm going to go ahead and put parentheses here. This derivative requires the chain rule. Okay, so just ignore this right now. The e to the 5x squared, just ignore that, and we're going to do the derivative of this. So here we are. The derivative of this, what's on the outside? The 1 half. So something to the 1 half, its derivative is 1 half something to the negative 1 half power. That takes care of the one half. I'm not going to cross it out because if I start crossing everything out, I'm still doing the product rule and I might like miss something when I'm writing this down. So, but maybe in your head, cross that one half off the list. And now what's the derivative of 3x plus 1? Well, it would be 3. Okay, what are we doing? We are doing product rule. That's the big picture. And so we did the derivative of the first times the second plus the first times the derivative of the second. And look at the derivative of the second is going to require chain rule to take the derivative. So ignore that first part. I'm going to take the derivative of e to something. What is the derivative of e to something? Well, it is e to something. Okay, so that takes care of the e. Cross it off. And now I'm taking the derivative of 5x squared. The derivative of 5x squared is 10x. Once again, this is the product rule derivative of the first times the second plus the first times the derivative of the second. Okay, so let's clean this up. Y prime is, well, looks like we have a negative square root there, so that's going to get sucked down to the bottom. I have a 3 on the top, an e to the 5x squared, see on the bottom I have 2, 
and then we have 3x plus 1 to the 1 half power, but I'll write that as a square root, and that's a matter of style. If you want to keep it to the 1 half power, you can. So that's that first term right there. This whole, these two factors is that. Then we have plus 10x e to the 5x squared, so I'll do that. 10, we like to put the coefficients in the front, x e to the 5x squared. And then this guy right here is a square root, if you'd like to change it to the square root, square root of 3x plus 1. Okay, so now let's get a common denominator. That was a joke. I know I, I always tell my kids, if no one's laughing, then it's not a joke. Okay, so there it is. Um, we're not going to get a common denominator. Could you, if you wanted to, you're like, yep, I'm locked in, up inside my house. I think I'll get a common denominator. Just keep that to yourself. That is problem number eight using the chain rule within the product rule. Let's go ahead and do problem number nine. Maybe you want to pause the video. Maybe you've been pausing on every problem to see if you can do these problems. Go ahead and take the derivative of this function right here. So it looks like we've got a quotient. So here's the top, here's the bottom. What we're going to do is the quotient rule. Within the quotient rule, we'll have some chain rule. So let's go ahead and do this. This is y prime equals. The quotient rule says the derivative of the top times the bottom minus the top times the derivative of the bottom all over the bottom squared. So let's see if we can do that. The derivative of the top, well that requires some chain rule. It's going to be, now watch, I'll show you a little trick. This is e, the derivative of e to something is e to something. Okay, we cross out the e. And we just have to take the derivative of 2x plus 1, which is just 2. Now, lots of times I've just been putting the 2 over here, and this is not really a trick. But, you know, as you get better, you can just go, oh, I've just taken the derivative of the top. And you have that right there. So the derivative of the top times the bottom, 3x squared, minus the top. times the derivative of the bottom. Well, the derivative of the bottom does not require the chain rule. It will just be 6x. This is all over the bottom squared. Okay. So there's uh, different approaches you can take. I mean, this thing may not be simplified. It probably isn't. One approach, and it's not popular with some people, is to factor out whatever you can from the top, because there are two terms on the top. And each of those two terms have what in common? They have this guy in common. And they also have an x in common. And they also have 2 times 3 is 6, a 6 in common. So now I'm just doing some algebra. So I'm going to factor out a 6xe to the 2x plus 1. So this first term, you almost took everything, didn't you? Except the only thing that you did not take was one of those x's. So I'm going to put an x right here, x. 
Meanwhile, over here, you took everything. So this is going to be minus 1. Meanwhile, on the bottom, you have 3x squared times 3x squared, which is 9x to the fourth. Okay, so now I do have one term on the top and one term on the bottom, and I can cancel. The 6 and the 9 reduce to 2 thirds. And you'll also get some canceling right here. This x is going to cancel with one of those four x's. So when it's all cleaned up, I end up getting 2 e to the 2x plus 1, x minus 1. See, the x is not there because I canceled, and then there's the 2. This is all over 3x cubed. Now, you could multiply that back through and write the top like that, but you don't need to do that. That is your answer. There's the derivative. A little chain rule mixed into a quotient rule problem. So you'll be doing this in your homework. Once it clicks, you're going to feel pretty confident. Let's go ahead and do problem number 10. This is one of those weird problems where they say h of x is f of g of x. Find h prime of 1. Wow. Okay, so what are we going to do? Well, you're going to do the chain rule here. So the derivative of your function is... I'm just looking up here now. You take the derivative of the outside. So this is f prime of something. Okay, and then you can cross out the f and then say what's the derivative of g? Whoops, uh, I'm jumping the gun there. There's an x there. The derivative of g is g prime of x. Okay. So that's really the chain rule. If you go back to the first page of the notes uh, right at the very beginning of the video, there it is. So we have an H now. We just call that thing H. We're going to plug 1 into the derivative. So this is F prime G of 1 G prime of 1. Okay, so the first thing we want to look at is this g of 1. Now, where's g of 1? g of 1 is this guy right here. It's 3. So we don't really know what these functions are, but we do have some data here. And sometimes in the real world, that's the way we work with functions, just from a bunch of data points. So this green part can get replaced with a 3. Okay, now I want to figure out what f, okay, so let me first emphasize the fact that that's what we did. Now I want f prime of 3, which should be on that table. f prime of 3 is 8, so this becomes an 8. times g prime of 1, which should be on the table over here. That's 5. So it all comes down to 8 times 5. 8 times 5 is 40. So that's how you do those weird problems. They may even give you one where they give you the graph of G and the graph of F. And then they set up the composition. And what you're then doing is looking at the slopes at certain X values. And the Y values as well when you go, like G of 1. 
Okay, let's go ahead and look at something. Before we jump to problem number 11, let's just take a look at our chain rule here. I'm going to do something, this is going to be a little theoretical, so some of you may want to skip forward on the video. Um, sometimes you'll see the chain rule written like this, and sometimes you'll see it written with the Leibniz notation. And if I just wrote that other notation, you would say, well, where did that come from? So I'm kind of deriving something. It's a short derivation. I'm going to let u equal g of x. Okay. So if I do that, I end up getting the following. Whoops, I just made the arrow come from the wrong spot. Okay, so this is going to say f prime u. And then this is g prime of x. And we really have f prime of u. And remember, u of x is really g of x, so I can replace that with u prime of x. Okay. And so if our original function, you know, this is our original function here, let's just say this right here, was like y equals, we're taking the derivative with respect to x, then what we're really doing here, this, this is really dy dx, so I'll write that down, dy dx equals, this is taking the derivative with respect to u, that's what that means, so this is really going to be dy du, and then this one right here is taking the derivative with respect to x of u, so this is going to be du dx. And so this is another way of writing the chain rule. And it looks like, look what you could do, it looks like the u's cancel and then you end up getting dy dx if, if you were able to do that. And it kind of makes sense that way, but this is just another notation. And you probably don't need to worry about this in the homework. So let's get back to some more problems here, okay? Yeah, Leibniz notation is important. In fact, the next problem I have Leibniz notation. Remember, this means what? This means the second derivative. So remember that this means y double prime. And sometimes in your book they want you to get used to the different notations because you may see these in higher technical classes. And remember we did the derivation in an earlier lecture where I lined up two d dx guns and then put y in the front and we, we've kind of derived why that is the case for the notation. So I don't want to do that again on this video. I'm just going to go ahead and take two derivatives of this. So look what I have here. I have x times the cosine of x squared. Looks like I've got a product. Okay, so let's go ahead and take the derivative of this. Um, what is this? Y prime equals. Okay, the derivative of a product. Well, that would be the derivative of the first times the second. Now this isn't the cosine squared, this is the cosine x squared. Okay, so I mean you could put parentheses around that argument if you want, but it's not, we're not going cosine x times cosine x. So here's the derivative of the first times the second, plus the first times the derivative of the second, the derivative of cosine something. The derivative of cosine something is negative sine 
something. And then, of course, we have to then take the derivative of the something, which is 2x. And so what do we have here? We have y prime equals cosine x squared. And then I'm going to say there's a minus there, so I'll go minus. There's a 2 there. 2. And then there's two x's, don't forget those, 2x squared, and then this is sine x squared. So there's the first derivative. Now, because we know we're going to take a second derivative, you could put parentheses around those. You don't need to. That might help you with the chain rule. Let's go ahead and take the second derivative, y double prime. Okay, we'll tackle this one first. This is a chain rule that says the cosine of something. The derivative of cosine of something is negative sine of that something. Okay, now I have to take the derivative of the something, which is 2x. That takes care of this first term. Now the second term is going to be rather traumatic because what I'm going to do on the second one is product rule. And we'll say that's the second part. And the first part I'll include the negative as well and put a little plus there. Okay, product rule says the derivative of the first. That's going to be minus 4x. I'll go ahead and put a plus here and then say, okay, so I'm doing product rule. So there's the derivative of the first times the second. plus the first, negative 2x squared, times the derivative of the second, which is a chain rule. The derivative of sine of something is cosine of that something, multiplied by, cross out the sine part, and now what's the derivative of x squared? 2x. Okay, so this does look like a mess. Let's clean it up a little, and I think the rest of this problem is just clean up. This is minus 2x sine x squared. That's that first term. The next term is minus 4x sine x squared. And then this one over here is going to be negative 2 times a 2, that's minus 4. We have an x there, x squared there, and an x there, so this is going to be x cubed. And then the cosine x squared. Now, before you box your answer, look what you have. Look at these first two terms. Those are like terms. They are similar creatures. Look, x sine x squared. x sine x squared. You have negative 2 of them and minus 4 of them. That's going to give you negative 6. Negative 6 of these creatures that, that look like this. x sine x squared. And then we have this guy right here which is minus 4 x cubed cosine x squared. And so there's the second derivative. So in your homework, they'll ask you to do problems like that. This was actually problem number 86 in the book. So I just went ahead and just took that problem. Let's go ahead and do problem number 12 in this lecture, which is this right here. It says, find the equation of the tangent line to this graph at x equals 4. Okay. 
So what I'm going to do first, before I start taking derivatives, um, this is x equals 4. We'd like to know the y value. Because the tangent line, we're going to need a point and a slope. So to find the y value, I'm going to go ahead and put 4 in for x. y equals the square root of 25 minus, let's see, 4 squared, that's 16. So this gives me 9 under the square root. Square root of 9 is 3. So the point is 4 comma 3. Okay. So now we're ready to go. Here's the point. We'll circle it so we don't lose it because it looks like there's a lot of math coming on this piece of paper. What I want to do now is take the derivative of this. Why? <laughs> Why? Because the derivative is really the slope function. And so I'm going to figure out what the slope of the tangent line at x equals 4 is. So before I take the derivative, I want to rewrite the square root as 1 half power. Okay, so here goes the derivative using the chain rule. I have something to the 1 half, which is 1 half something to the negative 1 half. Okay, so that takes care of the 1 half, and now the derivative of the inside is negative 2x. Okay, the 2's can cancel. You still have a negative right there, and an x. So what is this derivative? This derivative on the top, we have negative x. And the reason I said on the top is because this is a negative one half power cross the line change the sign. So on the bottom you have 25 minus x squared to the one half power. Or if you want, you can write it as the square root of 25 minus x squared. So there's my slope function. What I'm gonna do with this slope function is put the x value in there to see what the slope is. So y prime a 4 is negative 4 and on the bottom we end up getting 25 minus 16 so we've kind of seen that right there this is negative 4 over 3 and that is the slope Okay, so we've done these problems many times in lecture. Hopefully you've done them many times in your homework. We have to finish up this problem here. The tangent line is going to look like this. y equals mx plus b. We know what the slope is. y equals negative 4 thirds x plus b. That's by putting the slope in. Now we're going to go ahead and put that point in. So 3 is the y value. We have negative 4 thirds x. Oh, that's a bummer. There's going to be a fraction on this plus b. So looks like 3 equals negative 16 thirds plus b. Multiply the equation by three if you like or you could just work with fractions I don't know what you want to do on that I'll multiply the equation by three so I end up getting nine equals negative sixteen plus three b twenty five equals three b and b equals 25 over 3. So now you could see that the equation looks like this. Here's the equation, negative 4 thirds x, and now we know what the b is. So our equation looks like this. Our tangent line is y equals negative 4 thirds x, which we see right there, plus b. Okay. 
okay, we're done with this problem, but what really happened? I'm actually going to show you a picture, but before I show you a picture, so this is just a little extra, it's some stuff that maybe it's good to know. Here was the original function, and then we also had a point on that function, which was 4, 3. Do you know what this is a picture of? Okay, so let's square both sides. When I square both sides, so I'm just doing this for fun. We're done with the problem. I end up getting y squared equals the square and the square root neutralize, and we end up having just 25 minus x squared. I bring the x squared to the left-hand side of the equation by adding it. So this is x squared plus y squared equals 25. So what is that an equation of? This is an equation of a circle. Radius 5, center 0, 0. Now what is this an equation of? You might go, oh, well, isn't it the same thing? No, this is the a semicircle. Radius 5, center 0, 0. So you're like, what gives? How come this one's a circle, this one's a semicircle? And this is actually top half. Top half of a semicircle. Of a circle is the top half of a circle. So where did the whole circle come from if this is just a semicircle. The whole circle came when you squared both sides. When you square both sides of an algebraic, you know, of a, an equation, sometimes it adds solutions and it actually added the whole bottom half of the circle. Now, we could actually go the other way now. y squared equals 25 minus x squared. You may have remembered in pre-calculus of something called the square root property, where you square root both sides and you end up getting plus minus square root 25 minus x squared. Well, guess what? The positive one is the top half of the circle and the negative one is the bottom half. So in our original problem, we were just given the top half of a circle. Now some of you are like, who cares? It's good to know this stuff, because if it pops up in a future calculus class, it's good to know that circles have this property where, you know, because they are not functions. So, you know, of course, this is a semicircle. It is not a, um, circles are not functions. But this guy right here, this, the semicircle is a function, and we're going to see a picture of it. So we will get some visual satisfaction that here is the top half of a circle. There's a point, 4, 3, and then I've graphed the tangent line, and I did this on the computer algebra system. So that's what it looks like. So we have just found the equation of the tangent line at that point. And in fact, the first time you may have heard the word tangent line was maybe in a geometry class and the thing that your teacher did was draw a line that just kissed a circle. Here's the semicircle. And so now it all comes uh, full circle back to when you first heard of what a tangent line is. And so um, not to be confused with the trig uh, definition of y equals tangent x. So that concludes the chain rule section, section 3.7. But before we um, turn off the video, um, this problem 103 A, B, and C, that was assigned to show you the awesome applications of the chain rule. And I think this is very amazing. You have the number of hours of daylight at any point on Earth fluctuates throughout the year. We know that. In the nor northern hemisphere, the shortest day is on the winter um, solstice, and the longest day is on the summer solstice. At 40 degrees north latitude, the length of a day is, an appro is approximated by this. 
Now, are we so surprised to see the length of a day being approximated with a cosine graph? No, because what does cosine graphs do? They go up and down and they oscillate. And are we also surprised to see the 365? No, because they're modeling the days of the year. Now, of course, we can make it more complicated by factoring in um, leap years, but we're not going to do that. And D is measured in hours. That's hours of daylight. And we have this, where T equals zero is January 1st. And maybe this is a leap year because you have zero and 365. Well, the deal is they want you to approximate approximately how much daylight is there on March 1st. So you would have to put T equals 59. The, the neat thing about this is you're finding the rate at which the daylight function changes and that actually changes and that is gotten by taking the derivative of this and there is a chain rule. And so I think, you know, if, if you can't get this problem, don't stress out too much about it. You know, don't, don't spend like hours and hours working on this problem. But if you can figure this out, it's very satisfying because now we're making connections to the real world and this is just one of the many connections we can make to calculus. So do your homework, have a good day, and I'll see you in the next video.